And we got in the van, and it turned out to be Skank and Pickle. We just hopped in their van that night and led them to a party in the suburbs. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Slow Gherkin was formed in 1993 and released their first album, Double Happiness, which was distribu- distributed distributed by Asian Man Records on July 29th, 1996. They released their second album, Shed Some Skin, in 98, and in 2002, the band released Run Screaming, their final album. The band played a farewell show on August 17th of the same year, but played a sold-out reunion concert at Santa Cruz's Rio Theater on June 18th, 2011. In 2016, the band reunited to play at the Asian Man Records 20-year anniversary show and released two new songs. In 2018, the band played a few shows in California as well. They also played in Brooklyn, which we talk about in the interview. Thank you to Aaron Carnes, episode 111 or 111, for the intro to James. You can pre-order Aaron's book, In Defense of Ska, at ClashBooks.com if you'd like to do that. It'll come out in May 2021. I got James on the Skype, and here's what we talk about. Playing shows with the stereo, partying with Skank and Pickle, his thoughts on Double Happiness, Streetlight Manifesto, Asia Man Records, Ska Against Racism, the German Skinhead Story, their album runs screaming, and a ton more. A couple things before I start. Uh, I have a sponsor this week, and it is from Mike Pilak. Episode 18, if you'd like to go back and listen to that. Uh, he has a new film out, and it's called What Have You Done? And here is the write-up that he gave me. What Have You Done is a new short film from writer-director Mike Pilak. The film is about what happens when a powerful man with a dead body in his trunk confronts his fixer about what to do. When the identity of the body is revealed, all hell breaks loose. The film stars Jay Potter and Smitty Che, or Ch- Smitty Chai, I don't know, C-H-A-I. Sorry if I spelled your spelled if I said your name wrong there, Smitty. Jay is an actor who starred as Roger Mills on season one of FX's Rescue Me and has appeared in feature films The Big Short, The Call, and others. Smitty is an actor who has appeared on Madam Secretary and Blind Spot. The film examines the dark sides of powerful people in society and the lengths they'll go to to keep things secret. A timely piece in the shadow of a controversial election. This film has some strong scene connections, uh, because I had mentioned that Mr. Pilak was episode 18. Again, if you want to go check that out after this. The film's director of photography is Christian L'Esperance, or uh, Big Dick Swangin, as uh, as he told me to say his last name. (laughs) Um, Who is the brains behind the jersey Interchange. And Dave Flores from Taxi Cab Samurais uh, handled location sound for the shoot. Watch it now at blackoilfilms.com and go like it at facebook.com slash blackoilfilms for additional content, such as explainer videos about how the film was made. I also want to give a quick shout out to Mike Park, who has a new show on his YouTube page for Asia Man Records, which is youtube.com slash Asia Man Records. It's called Music. It's powerful stuff. So go check that out when you get a chance. And um, cool. If you want to support the podcast, one, go to patreon.com slash this was the scene. You can sign up for a dollar a month. Two, you can donate one time at thiswasthescene.com. Just scroll down at the top on the homepage. There's a purple button. You can go there and donate one time if you'd like to to keep this thing going. Three, you could buy merch at thiswasthescene.com. You could buy it for yourself or you could buy it for somebody else since Christmas is coming up. And you might want to order now because I don't really know how fast this shit's going to ship out. So, yeah. This week's review shout out goes to Richie Todd Lee. The name got cut off. Fucking A. Uh, Trip Down Memory, that got cut off too. So I guess it's Trip Down Memory Lane. Good job, Apple Podcast. Your your reviews are looking great on my phone. Uh, Five stars. For anyone from the Northeast slash a fan of the 90s, 2000s punk or pop punk scene. Really some great interviews with some different folks who kicked around the scene. After you listen to several episodes, you can start to piece the different pieces of the web together, all interconnected by and through the scene. The punk world is a small place. A great listen. Thank you, Richie Todd. Leh, as it shows on my uh, app. If you want to get a shout out on the podcast for your review, just go to, uh, I guess, Apple Music and leave one. And I also got to check all the other spots where people are probably leaving them. So my bad on that. Feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some punk, rock, or ska nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. 
That's funny. I was just thinking of Jamie tour stories and debating, and Rory once too, debating whether or not I should use them in this interview. <laughs> Wait, so you know those guys? Oh yeah, we toured with The Impossibles and The Stereo. No shit. Interesting. Yeah. I figured The Impossibles, I guess, I mean, obviously a ska band doesn't have to just go out with a ska band, but that makes sense. I didn't really know... I mean, we talked a little bit about who they went on tour with, but I didn't get a full rundown. I'm sure there were so many times they intertwined with bands that were around at that time, but that's fucking cool, man. Yeah, that, I think we might have toured with them twice, and it was because um, we'd already played a bunch of shows with Animal Chin, and um, oh, wow. then, you know, suddenly there were these super slick dudes in black <laughs> with really nice gear playing that <laughs> pop stuff. <laughs> so <Sellouts>. um, <laughs> It was fascinating. Their episode is so good. Um, they, you know, they just put it in in terms I hadn't really thought of back then. And um, what do you mean? And it definitely made well, just what Jamie was saying about like the magic word in that part of the podcast was um, the promise ring, and it was just like this instant flashback of every other band sounding like the promise ring all of a sudden yeah and how that would that was such a, a natural progression for ska bands who were suddenly embarrassed to be ska bands and why jamie would want to go in a completely different direction and go basically like am gold instead <laughs> so i thought that was cool i liked that they posted a picture on their instagram recently because in the interview they talk about how they've had this recording of this of this new album forever and jamie just hasn't mixed it and they finally posted a photo a couple weeks ago of him, kind of like a whiteboard with him showing his notes for mixing the songs and all that. And I think the thing I'm most excited about is going to be the podcast that comes out after that, because it's the two oh, of them, yeah. like they said, where they're going to just go. I mean, they got pretty raw in that interview where they just opened up and like, yeah, we just, they just, Jamie just like, took ownership of just how he how he was and then Rory and then like knowing that the two of them had split and then they're back years later and they could both just sit there and be like yeah it didn't really handle that well but you know fuck it yeah. it was 20 years ago or whatever it was 15 years ago but I really want to hear that pod, that interview of the two of them talking about all that stuff in more detail that just sounds awesome yeah yeah it's a beautiful thing when you can go back to those times that seemed so messy and there was so much bad blood and you just come back to it with sort of love and and kindness for everyone involved, even people you couldn't fucking stand at the time. <laughs> yeah, there's been a couple episodes where I've talked to, I've just said, I was like, oh yeah, I didn't handle things well at all for myself when I was in a band back then, and I was a dick about this. And then I've had conversations with people who are, I was like, yeah, I was talking mad shit about you back then, and I'm a real, real sorry about that. And they're like, oh, really? I'm like, oh yeah. I was like, I was a dick. I mean... You know, didn't realize at the time, but man, I'm just, that was so, that was shitty of me. They're like, oh, that's that's cool, whatever. All right. Yeah, and could you have predicted back then, like, you know, 20 years from now, there will be a new technology that no one's ever heard of, and we'll be coming together <laughs> and apologizing for this shit and having having some laughs. <laughs> no. It would be amazing to know that back in the, you know, late 90s. I think if I was told that, I'd been like, "Get fucked! No way! I'm not gonna apologize. Oh, I'm great. right. I'm totally right." Fuck that guy. <laughs> not apologizing on some future platform. So I want to give a shout out to Aaron Carnes, who I interviewed a couple of episodes back for his In Defense of Ska book, and he brought you guys up, which I I figured I would have because the way I structure this, if you've heard like the stereo episode, or if you've heard any other ones, it really just goes back and talks about leading you up into getting the scene, getting in the band, talk about stories about being in the band, and then pretty much living in the late 90s, early 2000 era. And, but I, I was very fascinated by the clip that Aaron said in his interview about your part of the book where he read a quote from, it was you, right, who said that you were trying to figure out, you guys were changing your sound, and then you put out, which record was it where you completely changed it and you felt that you were like you're getting blamed for being sellouts of ska and then you put this record that it's like not ska at all and then mm -hmm. you were kind of like we were just fucked either way and <laughs> i was so yes 
like that sold me on wanting to get that book because it was such an honest answer. What what album was that? That was it. Shed some uh, skin. No, that was like no. The first one. Shed some skin was still a was a yeah. sky album through and through. And, yeah. And um, and that was ninety eight. And then two thousand two, we put out our last album, which was called Run Screaming, That's and it. that that has no ska on it. It's like there's no ska guitar and I, almost no four on the floor beat. I think. I kind of I, I so I'm trying to like figure out where I do want to talk about that. I think kind of that gives a lead into what i want to work up to so i want to leave people hanging there for a second and then mm. you know make this you know uh give them give them what they want give them uh, some, some <laughs> mystery here <laughs> yes um but you're out in california right now right yep i'm in la i moved here I, I moved from santa cruz to new york i was there for a long time and i've been in la for um five years so is that why I saw a video of you guys doing a reunion show in Brooklyn? Yes. My God. What year was that? Uh, uh, do you not know offhand? It was on your Facebook page. I thought it was 2000. I thought it was pretty. It was recent. It looked like. Uh, it I think recent. it might have been 2013 or something. 2014 maybe. Yeah. 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 That's not that. I mean, that's six years ago, I guess. Well, almost seven years ago, you know? But I was wondering why you guys were playing that because I knew you were a California band. And it was where, because there's a link, that was it. There's a link on your website to buy tickets for that show, I think. <laughs> and I clicked like on it and it was part. like, it's sold out, but they didn't take the page down. Yeah, it's um on Sunday, June 1st, James, AJ, Matt, Phil, Ollie, Brendan, Achilles, and Peter will be getting back together once again to play at Rock Shop. 249 Fourth Ave in Brooklyn. Click buy tickets here, and you click on it. It goes to Asbestos Secret Show Sunday at the Rock Shop. Tickets available at the door. Fifteen dollars sold out, and it's still a page. I I'm amazed that's still on there. Do you know the the website for the movie Space Jam is still online, and it's exactly as it was whenever <laughs> that movie came out. Oh my gosh, what the right now? That's amazing. Holy yeah, shit. Precious internet relic. <laughs> How did you know that? Check it out. <laughs> it looks like it, made with, it was made with like GeoCities. Well, I, I have no idea, but it's a beautiful thing. Wow. Yeah, everyone should go check that out. Warner Brothers. Yeah. Copyright 1996. 96. Wow. Fucking A. So that's what, 24 years ago? Yeah. God damn, a little trivia there. All right, mm -hmm. I'm going to start this off, even though I'm going to leave all that in. Um, so yeah, the premise of this is to go back in time, talk about the late 90s. And ska seems to be kind of like this theme right now that I'm going in just accidentally tripped over because Aaron interviewed him about his book. And then Mustard Plug is going to be this week, but when yours comes out, it'll be the previous Friday. And you're going to come out next week. So I'm kind of going in this little ska direction here, even though I like I was, I got in the ska right when I got into the scene and I was big into Less Than Jake and like the whole ska scene. And then I definitely was one of the people that fell out of liking ska. And I've been very vocal, not vocal about that, but I've like, I'm just like, yeah, I was not a fan of ska and like the, like in the, like the early 2000s and stuff. I was, so I was definitely on the other side of the fence for being that one of those shitty people that you probably ran into. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and like, I mean, we definitely play with a bunch of bands that were Scott and I never hated it. We play with like the gadgets. Do you remember them? Of course. Yeah. We play with them a couple gadgets, times on tour. Kansas city. Is that where they're from? Yeah. Yeah. They were like all black hair. They looked like the refuse, but played ska like the refuse yep. before they were, it was like the refuse first album when they all wore black and had black bowl cuts. And, uh, yep. But these guys had keyboards and ska. But, um, all right, man. So yeah, let's go back in time a little bit. Let's talk about growing up. Um, what was as a young James, I think Jim or James, James, although everyone in the band calls me Jim just to annoy me. Um, I don't, I don't do that. This is probably the last time I actually say your first name. I realize I, I say someone's first name once and I never say it again through an entire interview. I kind of caught that the other day. I was like, I just never say the name, but yeah. So young James, uh, which you like to be yes. called. What got you, what was like the song or the music video that kind of caught your attention as a kid where you're like, opened your eyes up to wanting to get involved with music? 
Just music full stop, not ska or punk or anything like that. Yeah, just music in general. Like kind of open the door for you being like, ooh, I like, I want to kind of live in this realm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be Thriller, um, the song and the album. And uh, yeah, Michael Jackson completely changed my life at whatever. I think that album came out in 82. So I was like, God, I was five or six. And that, you, you know, the Thriller video, which is like a short horror film directed by John Landis. Yeah. I don't know how widely known that is anymore. And I know it's very tricky bringing up Michael Jackson at all right now. But, um, <laughs> but at that time, he was such a, a force and such an incredibly gifted artist that, you know, he just hit me like a tidal wave. And um, I wouldn't say he made me want to play music because it was the music itself seemed so like futuristic. It wasn't it wasn't really relatable. It's not a guitar album or anything like that. And uh, yeah, but just that the feeling of being overpowered by music started there for me. Did you like the um, showmanship of it, though? Because it, when that song came out, it was when he started doing and I've talked about Thriller before, but. It's he would do this giant premiere and the video would come out before the song, I think. Yes. But the album was out. So anyone who had the album would listen to it. But to put it in front of the masses came as a video and then it went on the radio. And I remember I remember that premiere and I remember watching it and being like scared out of my fucking mind watching this as a kid. But like, what was it about that about the was it just like the, the song was it the theatrics like what was it about it that drew, grabbed your attention i think the this the fusion of that irresistible pop sound the ferocity of his voice and the horror element is brilliant um especially as a kid where you're both terrified and just powerfully attracted at the same time so that thriller video was on tv about I feel like it was on like once an hour all over TV. You couldn't avoid it. Yeah. And I was obsessed with it, but I couldn't actually sit through the, um, that sort of prelude where he turns into a werewolf, especially when he, he first, he's Michael, he, something weird starts happening. He falls to his knees and then he looks up with the yellow cat eyes Yeah, and growls go away or something. I had to, just conveniently, you know, I'd be watching it with my sister or something and be like, oh, I have to go to the bathroom and just do that at the same moment in the video every time. Yeah. My sister quickly, you know, figured out what was going on. But I mean, I couldn't sleep for a long time because I thought Cat Eye Michael Jackson was outside my window, <laughs> even as I had posters of Michael Jackson in my room. It's, I've, it's very confusing to this day, but I think uh, it really set the tone. The, you know, the those two very conflicting forces. Um, I don't know. Maybe so, that's more of a therapy session. So, how did that lead to you getting involved in music? Or like, let's kind of lead that to the scene, right? Like, how did that lead to? Because there's always everyone I talk to, there is that thriller song or whatever was on the, at the radio and then there's that next song that comes in where a lot of people have talked about seven seconds being their like entry drug or bad religion huh. um yeah what was yours that kind of led you into moving towards playing in a band or getting in the scene whichever came first um well i have to make a quick stop at guns and roses That's which fun. was my next obsession um I don't know if there's a connection to be made between Michael Jackson and Axl Rose. I think there's one in there somewhere, but this was still like, it was still a little abstract for me because they just seemed like gods. Um, but from there, a couple of things happened right when we started high school. One was that we realized there was such a thing as a local band. Um, and we started seeing, you know, bands playing the quad or various high school functions and, and, uh, like, wow, you got like, 
this is almost as good as the stuff we're seeing on MTV, but you're just like some dudes who grew up, who are a little older than us. Yeah. So there was that. And then a mixtape that, uh, an older boy <laughs> made us that had a uh, waiting room by Fugazi on it. Oh, so wow. that, you know, that's probably the most consequential little piece of plastic with music on it. I've ever known because, you know, however many years later it is, Fugazi is still my favorite band and still a source of like energy and inspiration for me. So it was kind of those things at once. And, and that's when we, you know, uh, some of the guys from Slow Gargan and I, we started playing together in junior high, but that's when we really started playing out and getting very serious about it. So you got this mixtape, started listening to Fugazi, and you were going to, to and that led you going to local shows at the same time? Or, I mean, actually, no, your local show was the school, was your high school? Yeah, those things just happened at the same time. Okay. It was like, and it was crazy because, uh, the Guns N' Roses albums, the Use Your Illusions, Use Your Illusion albums were on their way out. They'd been delayed for, I don't know, months, years. And those albums came out right around the same time we got that tape and uh, started listening to Fugazi, The Descendants, Bad Brains, uh, Butthole Surfers. God, that tape was just incredible. That was that was <laughs> all on that so, tape. Those are all the bands on that tape. Yeah, that was all in this one tape. Twenty four seven spies, like some bands that I don't think anyone remembers. Um, the accused, but um, by the time User Illusion came out, I think we felt very conflicted because we were still like really excited to go get those tapes, but um, but we were also very rapidly moving away from like stadium rock and metal and being very, very excited about the bands playing around town and these punk bands we were just starting to learn about. What was it about that that kind of took you away from the whole stadium thing where you were more focused on the local thing? Like, did you kind of put, did you see like a difference between where the local, like what what drew you more to the local stuff than like the giant big stadium shit? Probably that we could identify it, be, identify with it, because by then we knew that bands were it. But instead of playing in a junior high metal band, thinking about, you know, being Guns N' Roses or Metallica or someone like that someday, suddenly it's like, you know, there's there's some recognition in punk bands. It's like we sound a lot more like that without even intending to. And we can actually see these bands. Um, so I think that was a big factor. Where was your high school? But Where that's was... a really good question. I'm sorry? Oh, no, no. Finish your answer, please. It's, I, I, don't, I don't have like a, an immediate answer to that question of why it was, they, it kind of immediately usurped um, stadium rock and metal. Other than like putting on waiting room where you're like, what the fuck is this? This isn't really what we know of as punk, but it's, it feels amazing. You know, it has, you can dance to it. Is that cool? I don't know. Is that uncool? Like, but it, by then it's got its hooks in you, you know? Were you playing guitar at this time? Yeah, I started playing guitar when I was about 10. My dad got me started on that. Um, and, uh, you know, got in the lessons and stuff, but really it was a social thing. It wasn't, I'm, I'm always in awe of like metal guitarists who talk about just sitting in their room for, you know, all day, every day. Like that, that was never any of us in Slow Gurk, and it was really about playing together. There was maybe a couple times when I started playing bass where I, I would get home from school, pick up my bass start playing tablature or put on some album and sit there and try to figure out what they're playing. Like I remember I got the rage against the machine, their first full length, their first album. And I, this is like right when I'm starting to learn bass, I'm sitting here trying to learn what Tim's playing and I would sit there for a long time, but I think that might've happened for a couple of days. And I was like, I, I want to go do other shit. <laughs> there are some people that are like, yeah, I just sat there for just like months in my room, just like jamming along. I'm like, how did you get so fucking bored? Like, it just, 
I'm trying to get as good at down picking as some of the kids I went to junior high with were back then, like kids who would play, just get up on stage and play Metallica songs by themselves on stage, but were shredders. Yeah. That's, that's my goal in 2020 to be like that kid. <laughs> now in my adult years, I want to be as cool as that 16 year old that was playing at the coffee house or coffee shop. So did you, when you guys started, when you put the band together, like how did the band form? You said it was in junior high, right? Yeah. Some of us um, started playing in seventh grade and that really was an, you know, an everyday thing. It was just default after school or all summer long, we'd go to our friend Josh's garage and, play and AJ and I that's when we started playing together we had we had been in school together since preschool although fun fact so AJ uh is the other singer and guitarist of Slow Gherkin um and the two of us started the band along with Phil and one other guy but fun fact (laughs) I kicked AJ out of our junior high band um because his (laughs) guitar playing wasn't cutting it and uh Matt, who went on to play trombone in Slow and had started playing guitar and just immediately was a shredder. Like, he's an incredible musician, as is AJ. But AJ, AJ was more kind of like this cool kid who really couldn't play. So I kicked him out when he was sleeping over at my house one night. Wait, how did that go down? <laughs> it was sad. I mean, it wasn't a fight. I remember we turned the lights out. We were sitting in complete darkness in my bedroom. I don't know quite, I don't remember how I did it, but he was cool. And uh, so then he had to go, geez, I guess like three years when we were playing constantly and then to quickly skirt past another whole big story. Uh, we started Slow in 93 and he was the guy. He was like the the creative force what do you mean you skip like go by the well like i just skip the genesis of slow gherkin the epic tale the of epic how tale. we decided to start a ska band yeah the origins which is actually this is so you guys <laughs> you start this band you kick him out three years later you bring yeah. him back and was that because you were you guys growing as a band and like one person didn't want to play guitar and you're like oh i know someone but this is going to be well the band difficult it, it was, let's see, the band I kicked him out of was a junior high metal band um, that went by many names. Uh, one of my favorites was the Dead Jesters. Um, nice. We kind of settled on Inner Sanctum and we're Inner Sanctum for a few years. But so that, um, okay, so what really happened is in um, the summer after we were in eighth grade, um, everyone but me uh, went and saw Skank and Pickle at the local community center in Santa Cruz. I was actually doing a play at the time. I was a major theater nerd. So I couldn't go, but I met up with the guys after my show and after they'd seen Skank and Pickle. And they were just, it was like they'd all been bathed in the blood of Jesus and were reborn. <laughs> and I'm like, dude. You know, it was the most incredible thing any of them had ever seen. Um, Just the insane energy of Skank and Pickle in those days. The costumes they wore. There were unicycles. There were uh, various juggling feats. um, And they had that look in their eyes like nothing is ever going to be the same. Um, Another fun story that I tell a lot is that that very night we were walking around the suburbs and a van pulled up and window came down and some older dudes were like, Hey, do you know where this party is? It's at this guy's house. And we happened to know the guy and we got in the van and it turned out to be skank and pickle. We just hopped in their van that night (laughs) and led them to a party in the suburbs. Holy shit. So it was a whole lot like meeting these guys who had just become our heroes and, and Mike, you know, who like, five years later signed us to his label yeah um, th- like Park. that's a that's such a weird thing because it's like he's out and about doing his thing and then dill records was the label at the time yes. that they were running and then he split 
think from the band and then them and started Asian Man because Dill was in Mike's interview. He was like, "Yeah, they just weren't really running it. They were running it their way, and I just didn't. I was gonna do my own shit." And yeah. it just it's wild to to just kind of put put the pieces together here or just connect the dots where you're doing a play, your buddies go see them play. And then that was the same night when they were going to the party or that was like a couple weeks later. Yes. Yeah, same that, night. Same. I had met up with them for God. a slumber party and we just started walking around and then around the bend comes this band. So it was a lot to pack into one night. We also, well, I can't speak for anyone else. I got very drunk. Uh, I was rolling around on the floor at this like college age band party. I remember that part. <laughs> rolling around laughing my ass off. That was a pretty cool guy. <laughs> you were like the, the, the drunk who was very in control and everyone's like, Don't worry, he's got his shit together. We don't have to worry about him. He's yeah. That thirteen year old knows what he's doing. <laughs> he's had two beers, he's rolling around on the living room floor in the middle of a party. That kid is solid. Yeah, that kid right there was just surrounded by Zima, empty Zima bottles. He's good right now. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, real quick, I, have you seen, I know this is jumping completely out of this, but because of, speaking of Zima, you ever see those memes where they pull, like the cast of Scooby-Doo pulls the the mask off of someone and they're like, well, if it isn't, and they like will say the name, but they did that and it was like, it was basically mimicking it said truly on the guy and they take it off it's like well if it isn't zima in disguise <laughs> have you seen this i'm not really doing any justice but when you no. see it, it's pretty funny no yeah but it's, it. it's pretty hilarious so you're 13 you get picked up by a van of dudes asking where they want to go to party you guys go with them did that kind of start like a relationship with just being friends with those guys or was that kind of a one-off and then years later after you had become a ska band or playing you guys reconnected with mike well we reconnected when i think we'd been playing for about a year and had something of a thing going on around santa cruz so that when skank and pickle would come through town we would open for them um man that was early enough, you know, I played drums in Slow Gherkin for the first two years. I played drums on the first album. Um, anyway, I just remember I was still playing drums and we'd play the Catalyst or Palookaville um, with Skank and Pickle, which were just epic shows. They were our absolute heroes. And, um, and we actually put out the first album on a very small label out of Sacramento. And then Mike... It was a weird time. Mike was basically like, if you can work your way out of that deal, you, you can re-release the album on Asian Man, which we did in 97. Which one was that? That was Double Happiness. Please okay. no one go revisit that album. Everyone it's should go really... revisit that album um, <laughs> <laughs> if you can find it. I don't even think it's on Spotify. I'm on Spotify right now. Oh, wait, no. no, yeah, It's right there. Double Happiness. Yeah, 97. Yeah. It's right above Alive, so all in the bottom. You guys want to check that out? Why don't you like that album? <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what don't you like about that? Oh, God. You know, we were mostly trying to be funny um, and not succeeding. And, oh, God. I mean, I haven't revisited it in so long, but we we nothing had gelled at that point. The album is all over the place there's some live stuff like we recorded our first stuff in a trailer in moss landing i can't remember if anything from that is on there we recorded in the trailer and behind a guitar store and some of the stuff is live from a parking lot in santa cruz so the songwriting the sound pretty much everything i'll just repeat that i was playing drums before we got the colossal ollie olsen on drums so it's really, you could really give that one a miss. And uh, if you're interested, just head for the other albums. Well, I mean, if you're on Spotify, it's number th uh, third down, Salsa 3. It's got 11,510 yeah. uh, downloads or plays. Hey. Look at you. All right. Look at that song. Everyone should, should check that one out. So you're playing drums. Or not. Or not. You should definitely yeah. not check that out. James, I don't <laughs> want you to listen to that. So how does that 
you guys are on that label. You record this album that you fucking despise. Um, did you like it when you put it out? Um, boy, that's a good question. And like, did we even pause to reflect on it when it came out? Um, yeah. there was certainly always that anxiety of like, oh, if we listen to it, maybe we'll realize it sucks. <laughs> But, you know, that reminds me, I, I did listen to your Less Than Jake, your m most recent Less Than Jake episode. Yeah, and I thought you asked a question that was so incisive when, uh, oh, God, is it Chris? Chris, The guy yeah. you just interviewed? Yep. Yeah. Was talking about those early days and how hard they hustled, you know, to get the following going and all that. And you said something like, you know, as you were building, as your following was growing, were you thinking about like whether your music was good enough to warrant those bigger audiences, which like, you know, that's a challenging question. Um, but it's such a good one because it's, I mean, that could get lost in the shuffle. I'm not saying it did for them, but it made me think about us. And, um, you know, there's so many things you have to consider and there's so much like, energy flying around especially when you know being in a ska band at that time when it was just starting to pop up everywhere yeah yeah i'm not sure the quality control <laughs> was there as much as it should have been um and we certainly weren't thinking about what if we get big and our songs are garbage yeah <laughs> but, but at the same time though you said that we were also like in our mid-teens right you know, I mean, but at the same time, I mean, that was kind of a, it was almost like a, what's the term? Um, it's almost like a laboratory at that time where people were just coming up with shit and throwing it out there because it was just, I wouldn't say it was the Wild West, that's a bit aggressive, but it was a very playful time where people were trying shit left and right. And yes. you would take a sound that existed with a certain beat and a certain strum of a guitar and a certain way you sang, but then people would say, well, let's kind of like, well, we just kind of branch out. Let's, let's advance on that and see how weird we can go. Or like mm -hmm. we can kind of compress it more and make it a little bit harder. We can go out and just make it like as weird as we fucking want to. And that's what I loved about that whole era is because people would show up and do that shit. You know I mean? It comes even like Adam in his package. I mean, he went completely off of what people were doing and just had like, <laughs> You know, just his own little sound system, and he would just Hell sit yeah. there and make songs. Yeah, and that's that yeah. was the best thing because no, it, it, it's like so something like that is again as much as you can not be a fan of that album, it it's, it leads you to that direction of going all right, even if you weren't paying attention to it and knowing at the time what you really thought about it, because the next one up was Shed Some Skin came out after that, right? Yeah, and then was that the one that, and was, that was Asian Man? Sorry, no, no, yeah, yeah that was well, yeah. He re-released Double Happiness and then Shed Some Skin came out in 98. And that was one where we really did drill down on the songs. And um, we had like a, I don't know how many, like three months or something where we practiced from, we pra basically practiced full time every day. Why? And, like what, um, what led you guys to being so, to doing, to going from kind of loose to being like drill, it's just fucking... Let's solidify this. I think we were um, inspired and kind of um, saw other bands around us had kind of thrown the gauntlet down where it was like, oh man, we can't just like fuck around here. We have to actually make really good music. And, um, you know, there were bands like the Siren Six out of Minneapolis. And yeah. Uh, yeah, they were awesome. we had just started to get to know MU330 at that point and we probably played with Animal Chin that year and so it was, suddenly it wasn't just like goofy high school stuff and also you know that between Double Happiness and Shed Some Skin we uh, we graduated from high school and uh, we're maybe you know the title of that album is about growing up which uh, we thought we were doing at that time you know, yeah. Um, I think we were. Let's see. I had just turned twenty-one when Shed Some Skin came out, um, and the, yeah, I was. I think I was the youngest member of the band, but the oldest 
you know, it, it only ranged a few years up from there. Um, but yeah, I mean, the one thing that Chris less than Jake was saying is like, there were so many comps going around, you know, you get on some compilations and then whoever, you know, wherever that region, um, whatever region that represented, you can, you can build a following there. And that was an incredible thing, but it hit a saturation point probably right around Shed Some Skin came out, um, when that album came out and, um, and then it just kind of got gross how flooded it was, how many bands there were, how many comps there were, how many labels. And um, I think that's when bands like ours started to get embarrassed about being a part of it. Um, In 97? No, no, this is, I think, you know, I always say the wave broke like right around the time Shed Some Skin came out in 98. Um, And then from there, you know, we, we broke up in 2002 so it was like a pretty steep decline between those years and not but i mean in a taking the broader view this is not a linear thing at all yeah as evidenced by uh stuff that's happening now with scott it's just so incredibly inspiring and the fact that there's a new plea for peace comp and suddenly i am just me personally am aware of like so many ska bands I didn't know existed um, that are, you know, maybe it's more vibrant than ever now. And there isn't that sort of stigma of it just being an embarrassing fad. You know, we, we covered that, you know, that part's done. So now you can just do it and love it. You know, I yeah. love that. It's almost, there's always something that has kind of a, I don't know, this is really good comparison but skateboarding skateboarding will always just be skateboarding is kind of like and i'm trying to say this where it's like not being um it's coming off the wrong way but like skateboarding is like comparable if it was music be like hardcore music or punk right it's like it doesn't never really went mm-hmm. away and it's like it's just i don't know anytime i see like skateboarding people skateboarders really never get shit unless it's by like authority or something but like if people see skateboarders like that's cool it's almost like ska kind of had like the shit go against it like when people were aggressively rollerblading (laughs) you know it's like it came in people were like all right this is cool i mean i'll admit like i was one of those kids like me and my friends were like we're gonna aggressive rollerblade we're gonna go grind some curbs and then like it was cool for a summer and then we'd show up at skate parks and people were like, what the fuck are you guys doing here? And we're like, Oh, yeah. we're not really welcome, yeah. but we're trying to do the same thing in the same area or arena as you guys, but we're just not riding on the same thing that you think it's as cool. I feel like Scott kind of got like shit on like that at the same thing where oh, yeah. it did pop. It was really fun. And then after a while, for some reason, people just started getting sick of it. For I don't even know what really started that, but like you guys got such, like really got shit on hard. And but like <laughs> real big fish, like they still they're still playing to this day. Muster Plug, they still play to this day. They never stopped touring. And these Amazing. guys just stick, yeah. So you stick through, but then you get like the real purists who like that music, and they're the ones who come out to the shows. And it's almost like the, I think that would be cooler. During, during like between 2002 and now, or yeah, I think 2002 to 2010 was probably pretty shaky. And then after a while, yeah. the right people show up and you're going, this is actually cool because everyone here wants to be here and we're creating something pretty awesome right now. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, wow, there's two things to unpack there. One is I love you that you use the term purist uh, to describe these later eras of ska because when we were doing it purist was just code for trad you know people trying to sound like trad was vague enough that if you sounded like the early specials or any of the studio one bands you were trad and maybe you were the only one who really understood ska not like these idiot you know suburban dorks doing it like us yeah so i i I vehemently support <laughs> the <laughs> kind of uh, evolution of the term purist to mean people that that basically um, 
what does that mean now? Who just, who just kind of don't see that stigma to it anymore? Yeah. That are sort of out, out and proud skankers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and no yeah, the other thing I wanted to say is, um, is yeah, the aughts, not a great time for ska. And then, uh, but then Rosenstock was doing ASOB and we never overlapped with them. I don't even know when they formed, but, um, you know, there were, there were a few bands from our era who kept it going, but as far as I know, ASOB kind of led the charge for what was then some, you know, kind of mumbled about as the fourth wave. And, and it's cool that that, that like no one ever talked about the fifth wave. We just ran out of waves after that. It's all <laughs> one big wave at this point, And I'm, I'm relieved about that. Well, I mean, you think about it, right? I th- the more that I th- the more that I'm thinking about this, it's ska opened up a door where it could be very. The first word that came to mind was clumsy, but it's jokey. I think. Yes. Was it right? It became very jokey. Where Weston did that with punk music, and it didn't get it didn't get too overblown. Where it became like every band was coming out and just being like, "We're making fun of this." Where with Ska, there was a lot of bands doing that. Again, like bringing back Real Big Fish. Um, mm-hmm. It was it was such a bright, happy sound that you could go and be goofy. But sometimes the things get too sugary, I think, and too not taken seriously. Even though I think a lot of people were making that music and they were taking it seriously, it sounded to other people that it wasn't being taken seriously. So maybe that's what kind of fucked with it a little bit. I, I guess I mean Real Big Fish kind of made its career on on satirizing its own genre, right? I don't right, but if a whole know. genre though starts going in that direction and more people start doing that, then don't you think maybe that kind of fucks it up a little bit? You don't have to agree. No, I just I'm just thinking that might be it. I no, don't this is that's some heady shit right there, man. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting deep, I don't. Man. <laughs> I don't really think the, like. I don't think that kind of snarky sellout, real big fish take ever like. Became cynical or anything like that. I don't think it overtook, the genre. I think people were too busy fleeing from the genre to stick around and make fun of it. Yeah, but you did bring up a good point though when you said Promise Ring, because Promise Ring came in and they made it very. Well, I would say I wouldn't say serious. They kind of had like a goofy take on it, but that was with the whole emo thing came in where people were like, "We're gonna go to the show to cry," <laughs> <laughs> and you were like, "We're here to give you guys a good time." Why is everyone wearing turtlenecks and look really fucking sad right now? Obviously, you're not gonna accept this because you want to live and wallow in sorrow. So we're kind of fucked at the moment. <laughs> yeah, although I, I mean. I was and am very confused. My my lyrics, I wouldn't dream of saying like my lyrics were emo, but they were all pretty fucking dark. I never did write a love song until that Lives EP five years ago, whenever that was. And uh, it was all kind of satirical or tormented <laughs> because in Santa Cruz, emo was huge and it really was the very like ragged early style of dudes facing the back, facing their amps, screaming, crying, rolling on the floor. You know, so by the time Promise Ring came out, I I don't think I would have called them emo. They were so poppy. And when you saw them live, they were just fun. Yeah. Yeah, they were. It's like even as I was saying that, I was like, well, no, I do remember them. They were like, Davey would be smiling and playing. And they had like, they were just bopping around. But they were thrown into that whole emo thing. But then I'm thinking that Jimmy at Worlds at the same time, Texas is the reason, mm-hmm. Mineral, mm-hmm. Mineral comes in, and that was like pure, just there was no smiling, and that's that, that. No smiling. That like, no, it wasn't allowed. Yeah. <laughs> so, Funny side story. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And I feel like at some point we have to bring in Streetlight Manifesto as, as you are a Jersey guy, and that was probably the last time I played in Jersey is when I toured with them. Okay, um, yeah. But just a funny side story off of Promise Ring. I was touring with uh, with Dan Podhast, his sort of rock band, The Stitch Up. We opened for Streetlight Manifesto on this tour. And we were down in Atlanta at this legendary place called The Masquerade, which is three levels. Heaven, Purgatory, Hell. 
Heaven's the big, I don't know, maybe a thousand capacity room. Uh, Purgatory is the small one. And then on the ground floor, there's hell, which is, I don't know, like 300 maybe. So in one night, Streetlight Manifesto, just like, they're, I, they just astound me how how consistent they are. So the the whole tour was sold out. They packed the top of the masquerade. In Purgatory, I wandered down. And what was Davey's band? Did, was his band Maritime? Yeah, I just found out about them a couple of years ago, and I didn't realize they had been around for so long. But yeah, that was a, they're fucking really good. Yeah, and I believe the bassist of the dismemberment plan was in there. Um, Eric, maybe? Or I, or maybe he was touring with them. I don't know. Anyway, I wandered down there. I was like, holy shit. That's the guy from the Promise Ring and the guy from the Dismemberment Plan. This is, <laughs> these are like two heroes. And then in Hell, this metal band, I believe they were called Juke. Uh, they had had a much bigger show booked in town that was so undersold that they had to play um, the you know, the ground floor space in the masquerade and they still, but they were big enough that they had a massive stage set up like lights and different levels. And, um, you know, they went on, they're like, you know, man, we had to, we had to switch to a smaller venue, but for all you guys who were here, we told our crew, man, get this whole stage set up. So it was like a third of the entire club <laughs> was this insane, like arena rock stage set up. And, uh, and then awesome. a small but very uh, happy crowd. So in one night, I opened for a streetlight, watched Maritime, and then watched Juke. <laughs> those, are, those are the good days on tour. What year was that? Uh, 2007. You know, this was well after oh, I moved wow. to New York. And um, I hadn't been on a national tour since 2002. And Dan asked me to play bass in his rock band the stitch up and we went out with streetlight for a month and um yeah playing their hometown of sayerville i don't remember which venue it was i do remember being at the merch table and it being so crowded that the table started to float the table was just drifting down the hall away from us what and the merch yeah it was like a stampede <laughs> A little dude. It wasn't like scary or anything, but it was like our merch is floating away. Uh, what do we do? <laughs> <You know? laughs> was that what that was? That, was, that was been Starland, Starland, Starland Ballroom. That's like the giant venue in Sayreville. That sounds right. It was like a big ass club and just in the middle of nowhere. If you remember, that sounds right. Yeah, that's maybe twenty five hundred capacity, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that that's the place that would have giant shows like the Get Up Kids last show before all their other last shows. They uh, <laughs> their first last show that was their mm -hmm. tour that was there. But yeah, that's that's had some big ass fucking shows and yeah, yeah I never I, it's I mean even though you say that like I never really got into Streetlight and I never really got into Catch Twenty Two back then. I mean I knew about them, but they were it was weird because Catch Twenty Two would be happening in the scene that my band was in too, but I mean, they were way bigger and, but it was just kind of like always happened around. Like I never showed up at a show where they were playing or like, it was, hmm. yeah. I, and everyone's like, yeah, man, they're on victory records. It's weird. Cause they're on a hardcore label and all this crazy drama and shit went down with this band, the singer left. And it's like, what? It's such a fascinating thing, but it, it's like, I only know just from that. I don't know like all the full details, but Streetlight, they're still a band. Like even now, I believe so. Right? Yeah, like they're still yeah, yeah. We're, we're still torn around. Um, no one's really doing that. Yeah, yeah. But I just we I never got to see them play ever. And I'm like being in Jersey. And Jersey's very tiny, but there's a lot. Of, but they're a diehard fan, so they fucking love. Um, oh Street man. Line. Yeah. Yeah. Ferocious. But you guys got to tour with them like when you were, or was that just you got to tour with them when you were filling in? Yeah. Only. Only. In 2007, I we never crossed paths with Catch-22. Slow Gherkin never did. So that was all new to me. And that was that was me realizing that, that ska bands were still happening, that kids still 
loved it. So I'm very grateful that I got to go on that tour. Did you have like a real big passion for ska when you guys were in the band or was it just a style of music you enjoyed playing? More the latter, you know. We always loved and still do the specials, and Op Ivy, Selector, Bad Manners. You know, we we got to tour with the Toasters, which was so fun. So fun watching those guys play every night. But as far as what we were listening to in the van, other than bands I just mentioned and some comps, it really, it's probably a lot more like what Jamie and Rory were saying, like Weezer and later on Foo Fighters and then stuff like the Cars and Squeeze and Elvis Costello, always Fugazi, Supergrass. These were things we just listened to endlessly. So yeah, we weren't really studying it. We probably didn't think we'd had to because we were just immersed in it all the time. And, you'd, and oh, I got to add like the friend bands, some of which I mentioned, Siren 6 and uh, ME330 and God Almighty, yeah, The Impossibles. Those were like, we would definitely kind of study what they were doing and like what we could learn from our friends. You get a lot out of that, out of kind of, I, I have no idea if we ever were that kind of presence in other band vans. Like we got to, we got to learn some stuff from Slow Girk and those, those guys got it dialed. I don't know if any <laughs> band ever said that. I'm sure they, I, I'm sure that definitely was a conversation. Like people always look at a band, they love it and they're like, do you see them do this when they play live? It's the coolest shit ever. Or like that style is fucking that's how do they do that? Like everyone always has that with with a band, definitely. I think there was something to the the live thing. I think every night, no matter what, we wanted to really burn it up and push ourselves as hard as we possibly could, and that's not sustainable. You know, we're we were never like we we did some solid touring for like four years, but we were never road dogs like me me three thirty or or streetlight, like we didn't really last that long. <laughs> and, um, and when we play these reunion sh shows now, it's always like, fuck, if I can make it through three of these in a row, <laughs> I will consider myself very lucky. If I have a voice and if I can uh, move like my neck, um, <laughs> yeah. that's a win. But you got it. But there's no other way. We're, there's, we're not going to like learn how to do it smart and pace ourselves there is no pacing ourselves just got to burn it up and then and then if you're if you can't produce sound through your vocal cords you got to figure something else out i have had, actually had to like pretend i was singing parts of songs when there were backing vocals i just mouthed along because i had no voice did you ever take voice lessons back in the day just learn how to warm your your voice up before you played i tried you know like ollie's the drummer's wife is an incredible singer she god bless her tried <laughs> to teach me some basics and i just like i just felt like i will never get this i'm i'm way too far gone with my extremely bad vocal instincts and habits um so i'm just gonna sound like Kermit the Frog getting strangled <laughs> indefinitely. That's just how it's going to be. <laughs> That's just your style, man. You just have to roll with it. That's my brand. That's your brand. That's, brand. That's your yeah. personal brand. Yep. <laughs> That's what gets you through Instagram and it's your hashtag. That's right. Strangled Kermit. <laughs> yep. By the way, real quick, your Siren 6 show was in 2018. August twenty fourth, right. two thousand eighteen, the bottom of the hill with you, those guys, and great apes, because it's on the That's internet. Right. Yeah. So that was not two thousand thirteen. That was very recently that you played. Well, that, that was different from the Brooklyn show. Oh, um, is it the Brooklyn show? I thought bottom of the hill was. No, the no, no I'm just because we were talking about that Apple Stomp show we played way oh, back rock shop. in two thousand thirteen or fourteen in New York. We yeah, Siren Six reunited and we played two shows with them in 2018 and yeah it was so amazing our first national tour 1997 was with siren six i think we went out for six weeks um members of our two bands booked the entire thing themselves 
most of us were not yet of drinking age and um it was the whole epic journey so many stories from that like which ones would you like to share <laughs> well just quick ones just a, yeah, yeah. a little hors d'oeuvre like siren six used to tell a story about us like we there were nine of us and we did everything by vote we were way down in florida we had booked a show that went like way down in florida huntsville alabama way way down in florida like miami and it was just an obscene amount of driving and at some point after that first florida show someone was like are we uh are we sure we want to do this? You know, we could just call up the place in Huntsville and, and say, so, you know, we can't, we can't do this. Sorry. So the Siren Six eye view of this it was that we stood around in a parking lot for like an hour in a circle arguing about it. And then the hands finally went up and we, those of us who wanted to go up to Huntsville won. And we drove, pro we probably did an all-nighter to get there. And it was like a house show, but it was a fucking epic house show. And we played with a band called the Grumpies that was just like, who are you guys? Where did you come from? You're amazing. I still have their tape. And then probably night drove again, probably stopped off at a Waffle House, got extremely caffeinated and drove down to Miami the next day. And no one regretted that. So that that's... The tour was a lot like that. Between that and showing up at some of these venues and they're like, who are you guys? What are you doing here? <laughs> like people not knowing we had booked the show, you know, yep. and also it being the dead of summer in like the deep south, the Siren Six never took off. They're all black outfits. They're black jeans. They're like turtlenecks and, you know, polo shirts. They refused to put on a pair of board shorts or take off their shirt, anything like that. Like during the day when they were driving or when they were playing? The whole 24 hours a day. I don't even think they took their black jeans off to sleep. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> I never got that. I never got when bands did that. We we toured this band called Saturday Super Kid, and I think they would always just rock jeans all the time when it was hot as fuck out. I'm like, are you guys like... Is your balls like melting? Like what the fuck? So people just commit, man. They just commit to it. Well, I I can speak to the ball melting issue, uh, <laughs> which for some reason I um, I always slept in the van because we had a loft, and I think I I I would sort of hit my limit of of being around people, and I'd need to go to a quiet place, which would be our 1978 Dodge Maxi wagon parked on the street somewhere. And again, dead of summer, like deep south, I would go cuddle up on the loft and wake up just drenched in sweat. And this thing happens to your boxer shorts where they like curl up. So you've got these like tight rolls of soaking wet fabric around your crotch. But that <laughs> happens beneath your jeans. And then you go staggering out. You know nothing about like the, the idea of hydration is completely alien to you. And you go staggering out trying to find whatever dorm the rest of the band is staying in. Pick up your $5 per diem and um, <laughs> go drink some garbage coffee. <laughs> it's good to know. So, yeah. Thank goodness for life lessons. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, something triggered right there. Tell me a little bit about Asia Man. I want to I like hearing everyone's perspective about how awful that. No, I was kidding. Like how how did you guys how did you guys get on and what was your experience being on the label? Let's see. Well, like right when we got on Asian Man, it was one of the most successful labels, one of the most successful indie labels in the country. You know, Asian Man was with a a company called Mordam Distribution that had like all the indie labels we worshipped. Asian Man was in the top three. It, it might have even been the number one selling label through Mordab. Let's say top three. That's definitely accurate for, yeah. the, for right around this time. Yeah, they were crushing it right around that time. Dear God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when did, when did Pezcor come out? 
95, 96, I think. It was Vinny, mm -hmm. Vinny said in his interview, but that's like two years ago. So I could Google it right now. But I think that was like around that time. And that, yeah. Well, that, that and Slapstick. That and Slapstick. So Less yeah. Than Jake, Slapstick, and then like the first couple of Misfits of Ska albums. It was just going through the damn roof. And then we signed on and there were nine of us and we had some pretensions about putting out like a real like serious all time album. And he put us in this beautiful studio and, you know, we got to work with the producer who, uh, who was Sammy Hagar's bass player. That was, you know, so we, we had that Hagar sound going for us <laughs> and like slow Hagar. That's right. Slow right. Hagar. Yep. That's what they called us at that time. I do. I and, uh, and we handed Mike the files for like a 22 page booklet because we wanted it to look like Repeater by Fugazi. And he he probably had to scream into a pillow, but he did not stop us from doing that. And um, so he's incredibly generous. We lost him a shitload of money and he never stopped supporting us. Um, we didn't like we were kind of like the. Mike doesn't do tour support. I don't know if he does for anyone. He certainly didn't. Like, it was unheard of for us. The idea that you would just sort of get paid to go on tour was like some weird major label shit we yeah. didn't understand. You know, he got the album out there. They'd send us this manila envelope of zine reviews every couple of weeks and very depressing sales figures from Mordam for Shed Some Skin, you know, because, again, 1998 is when things, when everything started to change. And then by the time Run Screaming came around, it was like, it was on a much lower, a much smaller scale. And Asian Man had changed a lot. And it, it like, I don't know, around the turn of the century, it became a lot more about the Chicago punk bands, you know. It's weird because I've reconnected with, um, with Neil from um, Lawrence Arms. And we've played some music together here in L.A., which has been amazing playing with that guy oh my but god realized, really that's awesome yeah Dude, that's sick i fucking love it and um and it's been very exciting because as we've been playing together he's also gone off and you know they recorded the lawrence arms album that came out this summer yeah skeleton coast yeah right yeah. this is awesome and i've had like a little window into that but i still think of lawrence arms as johnny come lately's i still think oh that new band lawrence arms you know because I was, only, I became aware of them like seven years after we got started, and you never really shake that. These new bands, Alkaline Trio, Lawrence Arms, they're coming out west. All right, we'll check them out. We'll we'll be their like elders. <laughs> yeah, we'll show them the ropes. <laughs> yeah, we'll show them the ropes. <laughs> Weird. I didn't think I didn't really put the pieces together that like you guys. You guys come in to, you come to the scene. You're on Asian Man, right where their Asian Man was blowing up, and yeah. Then you guys jump in, and then right around that time is, because I just keep thinking about the Warp Tour in '98, '99, and for some reason that is where I kind of felt like a vibe. I don't know why I'm thinking. I could be completely wrong. We're just like visualizing this, where it was a vibe that the ska was getting starting to get shit on. Mm-hmm. And then it really didn't, it, it was not forgiving in that scene at that time for a ska man. So if you guys, you're coming out, you're putting your first record out, Mike's taking that over, which is Double Happiness, and then you're putting out Shed Some Skin. So Shed Some Skin seems like right around then, it was just that tipping point where you got to feel a little bit of excitement, and, but at the same time, it slowly just started to crap out on you. Well, consider that early 1998 was the first Ska Against Racism festival. And we did, we did the massive show down in Orange County somewhere and one other. And um, it's so funny to think of that show. Appropriately, it had rained, so it was really muddy. And it was on this massive, you know, park or something. So it had some Woodstocky elements. And... Um, just so many damn people, so many bands. Yeah, Less Than Jake headlined that one, didn't they? I don't know. I mean, it sounds like they would have. Cause Skank, I think they did. Yeah, because Mike, Skank and Pickle wasn't around. 
and Mike was no. doing like Bruce Lee band, Chinkies. Um, he was doing his own acoustic thing. Like he was doing a bunch of shit, but I don't think that would have been a a, um, a main act. No, I think it was Left and Jake, and ME330 was pretty near the top. Blue Meanies, absolutely mind blowing. That was another band that kind of made us feel like we had to step up our game. And um, yeah, they were good. All down the line. And just walking around and running into members of bands you loved, you know, you either had toured with or never met before. That was almost like, you know, in the movie of Third Wave Ska, that would be that end of the second act. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. First, second act where like everything's going great um, and then everything turns to shit. Um, so between that springtime Ska Against Racism show and double, no, fuck it. Uh, shed some skin coming out in the fall of 98 at which time we were on tour with the toasters the album was not selling and this tour with the toasters might have been the first tour where they were like oh shit we're not we're, we don't have the draw that we're used to the shows were not as big as i think they expected i hope i'm not misrepresenting you guys buck but i that's my recollection is that they they were struggling to to get those guarantees out of the promoters and there were still great shows and there were definitely people there but it wasn't like it wasn't just solid you know sold out night after night yeah so by that that was it you know it was like a six month transition between like the the sky's the limit and oh shit this is this is all crashing down on us. That's fucking wild, man. Like that <laughs> that's fucking crazy because you get on that label that is killing it and then you're just witnessing like this thing you want to do. Where did you guys want to make this a full time like was this your full time gig between for all of you or or were you all no. trying to make oh, it was just like you'd go out here and there but come back, work some jobs. Hey, when are we going to go yeah. on tour again? Uh, I don't know. How's March sound? Great. Let's book that. Yeah, more of that one. I mean, 98 was almost full time because I, I took that year off of college. I had been going to college for two years and we really decided to sort of put it all on the line and tour as much as we could and and record and put out the second album. Um, but other than that, it was a little more sporadic. Dude's had jobs back at home we never made a goddamn cent off of that band i think there would be small payouts <laughs> yeah after some tours but no 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 did the you want it to do though it out. but did you want like well, were you guys bummed okay. because it didn't happen like that or well there were factions there was a two-year gap between aj matt and me and then phil and some like Peter and some former members. Oh, sorry, my cat's coming. <laughs> I was like, I hear a cat just kind of being like, can I be that's, on the podcast? Now? That's Mojo. He really doesn't like closed doors. He's like, what's going on? I need to pee on something to express my feelings. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, anyway, so AJ and Matt and I are the same age. Phil and Peter and... Um, some former members are two years older and we met when we were sophomores, they were seniors in high school. And it was weird because just that two years made a big difference in how we envisioned our future. Cause AJ and Matt and I are like, all we have to do is make sure we're like, we're kicking ass right now and we're not. And we were also very like, punk idealistic slash naive like in five dollar shows all ages shows that's it nothing else matters and the older guys were really thinking about like how do we make this work and how do we think beyond like the next show um so there were a lot of fights around that and and i absolutely ignored um and tried to block out any financial considerations and i a major factor here is I was raised comfortably, you know, I didn't have to worry about getting evicted or anything like that. I was in college. I had a family to fall back on and that was not the case for other guys. For other guys, there was a lot, it was a lot more of a do or die thing. So that's one of those hindsight 
things. I was terrified of any of those sort of businessy discussions and I didn't have to worry about it, you know? Yeah. I'm not proud of that. I mean, it was just like, it was just in front of your face, you know, you're just like, I mean, I'm good. <laughs> I, I never would have said that you, you can't. And I think this is still true, no matter how old you are, or say if you're, eh, I won't get into if you're running for public office, but like, no one wants to come out and say, I was raised comfortably, <laughs> you know? I mean, when you said that, I was like, man, I've never heard someone say that. Just be like, yeah, like I was, I mean, that wasn't like a, a factor for me for whatever, you know, whatever, however you saw that. But some people are just trying to work jobs and shit. But if you're just like, yeah, I'm just kind of was, that was, that was taken care of. It was, you know, that's why I I was not thinking in the long term. I wasn't. I was entirely in the present, and I really believed that if we just kept doing what we're doing, kept really pushing ourselves as a live band and getting better at writing songs, everything else would take care of itself, and that's how it's got to be. If you start actually worrying about the business side, um, you're going to fuck it all up. You're going to like shatter this fantasy or something. Yeah. It's, a, it's like a weird balance, though. I mean, that's the hard thing with musicians is that you're, you're creatives and there's an artistic side where that whole artsy thing is like, man, it's my art. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Some people are like that. Some people are like, yeah, we're just creating some shit. But then they're like, man, business can't touch this. You're going, well, metaphorically, you, have, you could have a nice car, but it's not going to get anywhere unless you put fucking gas in it. So exactly. yeah. continuously. Yeah. So, I mean, that definitely sounds like it. Th- that would have how many guys were in the band? nine <laughs> it like Jesus for most Christ. of it it was nine actually that i i the question i was going to ask I'll, 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 I'll if i remember it i will ask it again but I'm, I'm more fascinated by this because i was i was looking at this photo of the siren six flyer from 2018 where it's all of them there and then as we're talking i'm thinking like man i've never thought about ska bands touring together where there are so many fucking people it crammed in two vans and there's just two bands yeah. where you've got nine people or at least like six or seven in the other band. Yeah. That's it. Would, what kind of dynamic was that? Like, like did that cause for just an hour decision of where the fuck to eat? Or I don't know. Like it just, I figure like that so would much. cause some kind of a, a bit of a disruption with that many people being on the road together. So much so much um it was it was decentralized and there were nine of us and God. you know we'd make half-hearted attempts to assign a tour manager until that guy like threatened to quit and fly home and then you know but yeah deciding where to eat and then on up to like okay we have got to talk about some business stuff everyone shut the fuck up stop <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah stop playing your guitar stop skateboarding while we're trying to have a meeting you know stuff like that so it it was hard at times you know i will admit to i was such a fucking <sighs> let me think about what epithet i want to use i will just say that i like we'd go to waffle house and everyone would sit in a booth except i would sit at the counter and write in my journal and I just remember sitting there, like there were times when I would sit there thinking about if I could kick out one member of the band or if one member of the band could just go away, <laughs> which one would it be? Sometimes that's <laughs> all I had to keep me going. And I'm sure we all felt like that, even though we were best friends and had so many laughs and adventures. And and of course, we were, as a as a family, we we supported and um, looked and looked after each other because it got fucking dicey at times too, especially when we, you know, we could never afford a hotel. So every night you're saying, Hey, we need a place to stay. You're just asking someone in the audience to put you up. That's what we did. Yep. Hundreds of nights. And um, sometimes you find yourself in a gated community mansion. Hey, my parents are out of town. Help yourself to the fridge. And it's like, fuck yes this is amazing other times you there's some 
scary drunk dad who wants to show you his guns and make really inappropriate comments about like his daughter's friends and like you know, like if we if we if we try to leave now he might actually shoot at us so let's just um hope we make it till tomorrow morning but we had each other's back at the same time you know wow there were different there were hard skills and soft skills there was aj who can like the the drunkest most belligerent asshole at a bar aj can talk him down and make friends with him and then there are guys who can be a little more confrontational but we always had each other's back that right there with the getting on the stage and asking for a place to stay i've had so many bands talk about that and like my band we did we did the same like i lived that like i remember saying that mm -hmm. and it was never we never it was just like yeah anyone would put us up tonight and then you have three kids come up to the merch table at the end and then whoever like we our drummer was pretty much kind of our he was our basically our manager and he'd be like, all right, like, here's the deal. Here's where I'm going to go with. This seems pretty legit. And you would show up. It would be a gated community in this giant mansion. And their parents are out of town. And then there would be that thing where you'd show up sometimes. And this kid's like, yeah, you can stay at our house too. And you go there. And all of a sudden, the dad comes home later on. And he's like, what the fuck is this? And, yep. and he's like, okay, guys, well, um, here's the bad news. You can't stay here tonight. And you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. Or... One time, we actually, our last tour was with Lawrence Arms. and Oh, nice. Yeah, I don't know, because you, do you see Nail, like, a lot now, because you guys are playing? Yeah, yeah, or these days we text a lot. Ta yeah. Ask him if he remembers, because I know he remembers the tour, but I, I might be saying this wrong, but there was, we were about to stay with this group of kids, and I think it was Illinois, like, middle or southern Illinois, and they, Brandon was just like, I I'm getting the feeling that we're, these guys are a bunch of Nazis. Oh God! Um, I don't think it like came to, it came to a head, but I think the kid was showing Brendan and the Lawrence Arms guys his like Iron Cross f paraphernalia or some shit like that, and we were just like, okay, this is gonna. I don't know how this is really gonna turn out, and it, it didn't like go. It didn't go bad, but. Yeah, ask Neil if he remembers that at all. Um, if you like after this, if, if you want to. I, there was some I, weird I, shit. Wait. Yeah, there was like one party where they were the kids were just throwing bottles into the bathroom and shattering them, and like it was. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it was fun. I had a, a German skinhead bite me on the nose once in a very small town in Germany. Just in general, or were you guys playing a show? Gonna... No, no, we played a show, and. You know, when the culture is different enough, you lose, it gets harder to tell what page people are on, especially skinheads, you know, it's, I, I, I actually have no idea how to talk about skinheads, but I'll just admit that I have a hard time telling which skinheads are cool and have no bigotry in their hearts. I don't know. I don't know if I'm being totally unfair now. I, all I'm saying is that in Germany, you have a bunch of skinheads. Some of them seem to be just looking for trouble. Some you just can't tell. And this guy, after we played, kept getting me Jaeger shots, and he kept trying to get me to go to a party with him. And going between being kind of fun and menacing, and I was just kind of like looking for that moment to back away, but he kept getting shots. And then I was finally like, okay cool i gotta uh i gotta check a merch or something and he like he just kind of gazed into my eyes and then he came in at me and he just he just bit my nose not like it wasn't painful but he just he had his mouth around my nose and i was it was all like slow motion like what the fuck oh my god why is this strange man's mouth around my nose <laughs> and then he pulls away you're like thank you yeah, cool. See you next time. I gotta go by. <laughs> and what's funny is I did see him again just a couple nights later in Nuremberg at this club we went to just to to dance. You know, there he was, and I think he gave me a kind of friendly wave or something. And I thought, well, if anyone wants to beat me up at this place, maybe he'll step in. <laughs> <laughs> your buddy is gonna come and save your ass. Yeah, because he was a big scary dude. Maybe. Uh, Maybe this will all be like some beautiful fairy tale. <laughs>
That's fucking amazing. So how did you guys? So you guys, you guys go through '98. You you were like it was a hard downward slope between '98 and 2002, right? Yeah. And so this kind of brings back to what I initially started to talk about in the beginning when when you when Aaron read your quote from his book where you talked about run screaming where you base I forget exactly how you said it. But it was it was kind of like you were just you was it was like you were damned if you do you damned if you weren't but you were kind of pissed or bummed out that you made run screaming and you made it so it wasn't ska and that and that you were like looking back at that you were like that was just a, a shit move I think that's how you said I it. believe chicken shit move chicken shit move was, yeah that's how you said yeah, it yeah yeah <laughs> like talk about that a little bit I'm 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 interested in this. Like how that came, uh, like how the conversation was to record that, how you, I mean, obviously if you have nine, get nine guys in the band, you're leaving horns out. So where the fuck are they during this? It seems like it's a big to do. Yeah. We were shedding members. We were getting to an age where guys really had to like make a decision and make money and couldn't just kind of live hand to mouth for a year at a time. And just pulling apart there was no sort of collective vision anymore we'd show up to practice and it was kind of like pulling teeth i should say we didn't lose our horn section the last album is like a rock album with horns but they're still in there i'm trying to think if it was anything more tangible than that other than i mean because it was a four-year gap between shed some skin and run screaming with very little we did an ep in the middle of that and i talked to aaron in his book in defense of ska about our dalliance with mojo records who had done real big fish and goldfinger and oh yeah we're actually one of their producer and our guys was interested in us and you know we he talked to us in 98 and it was like you guys are awesome you know write some new songs send me a tape and by the time we got around to that six months had passed and they weren't ska songs and it was like that ship sailed so I think there was a sense of doom, even as we kept touring, and the songwriting had really slowed down. And it wasn't collective songwriting. I was in Berkeley, and I was kind of writing my own songs. AJ was writing his own songs, and um, that's not how we did it. Shed Some Skin, I think, barely holds together because there are nine creative voices going, <laughs> pretty much going simultaneously the entire time and i think that's actually what made us us for better or for worse all that like really overblown arrangement stuff all those layers all that density that's who we are we later aj and i later thought we knew a lot more about songwriting but like that was not that was not the quintessential us another like little fun fact i can't remember if i told her on this but we there was this A&R guy from Capitol Records who had signed, I know he signed Jimmy World. I can't remember who else, but he'd also, he was working with Siren Six and he had us come down to LA. AJ and I went down to LA to meet with this guy. He kind of gave us this pro bono motivational session. And he like, he basically said like, shed some skin, it's all over the fucking place. Your songs are too long. There are all these breakdowns and jams and, I think implying you're not Fugazi, stop trying to pretend otherwise. And just just saying like, write pop songs. Uh, Don't fuck around. Don't waste the listener's time. Just get right into it. And AJ and I were, that came right at a moment when AJ and I, I think were really insecure and kind of impressionable. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. We got to write serious songs, which I think so many bands did. They suddenly realized we're not writing songs. We got to we got to write songs that like you could play on an acoustic guitar and they would hold up like that. Um, (laughs) And you saw so many bands really invest in their songwriting, but it actually wasn't as good as, as investing in the energy and the sort of collective shit show uh, experience. Um, So I don't know at all if that answered your question. I'm trying to think of any sort of larger cultural forces at play but it was really it was I, I guess i'm realizing it was pretty personal for us in addition to shed some skin like not selling and everything changing that year it was just a very sad slow decline 
for us because it was something we loved so much. It was kind of slipping out of our hands. And I don't think there's any any other way it could have gone. Even if I hadn't moved to New York, the album is appropriately named Run Screaming because that's exactly what I did once the album was out. I moved to New York to go to grad school and that was that. Yeah. If I'd stuck around, I don't know if we would have been one of those just like perennial soldier bands like, you know, Big D and the Kids Table or any of the bands we've talked about. And maybe that's not right for us anyway. Maybe it was more of a kind of what I hope was like a a bright flash and then darkness. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I kind of think that the reason that, like you're saying, yeah, like Big D, like I talked to David, and and then oh. like, yeah, he was he was a really cool interview. He's a, he's a fun guy, but yeah, they they stayed the course, and then talking to Dave from Mustard Plug, like they stayed the course. I haven't talked to anybody from Real Big Fish, but just knowing that they still do it, and but the way that they did it, if you watch, well, actually, no, I'd say Mustard Plug. But my theory was that they just kept cranking out shit. And just not mm-hmm. stopping and just like not really it's almost like it's like having horse blinders on really. And they're not really paying mm-hmm. attention too much of what's going on around them. They're just kinda like, well, ah, we just kinda we'll just keep doing this because we're doing it for us, really. And I think if that's the case, depending on what your definition of success is, some people are like, success to me is that I get to be on tour all the time and I love it and People show up, people don't show up, but that's not, you know, it's cool. Obviously, we need the money for gas and stuff and pay some bills, but it really, I think it's just like a, me- a mental state of what's going to fucking keep you on the road and continuously playing so many shows. And yeah. it sounds like this thing just really beat the shit out of you guys. Um, <laughs> enough where, you know, you name the record Run Screaming, and then when you guys break up, you like take off across the entire country to get the fuck away from it. You know, so it's. <clears throat> It sounds like it just, yeah, it just beat the hell out of you. <laughs> You're like, I don't like this it, anymore. Yeah. It sucks. I mean, or we're just really sensitive dudes. But, but okay, final thought is like, yeah, all that happened a very long time ago. But I'll just return to like realizing that the ska scene might be more vibrant than ever right now. 2020, the new plea for peace comp um, is proof of that. and. I I do believe ska has always been uh, the most diverse genre I've ever been involved with. Um, And I've said this before, but I think it's the the, the uncoolness of ska, the fact that you can't be like, you really can't wear eyeliner or have flattened bangs, hair straightener bangs, and be in a ska band. It just doesn't work. And that frees people to come together from all all different neighborhoods and walks of life and just sweat and skank together. And um, I'm just so, it gives me such gladness to know that that's still going. And what Aaron is writing about uh, with things like the massive Latinx ska scene down here in LA, which we, we only really, I wish we had been more involved with uh, or had been able to connect with more we did a little bit um but the fact that these things are still going is i think what really matters and uh do you think it's because yeah sorry go on sorry go ahead no No, do you think do you think it matters just because do you think it works because there's no weight on it right anymore um, yeah, like I said, I think, you know, we've run out of waves. We're not talking about waves anymore. So it's really not about trends. It's about, we've been able to just bring it around to the joy. And I think that's what makes ska unique among genres is it's, it's joy raised to almost a political level. When people are that passionate about something I think that's incredibly powerful. Well, I think at the same time, too, there's kind of a respect maybe that was given to it because it's when something goes, when anything comes out and it's given a platform and praise with that really quickly is going to come people wanting to shit on it and shoot it down. And then when it gets something, when that does happen to something and it gets rolled through the mud and dragged through that and then it comes back up again, you kind of have to give a little bit of respect and be like, okay, 
All right. Yeah. We can't really do that again. We already did it. So here you go. It's like 80s bands. When 80s bands started, they were the top of the game. And then everyone was like, this is the biggest fucking joke as soon as grunge came around. And then now they can come back and tour stadiums again because there's such a giant nostalgia about it. And they could probably do it for the rest of their career now. Yeah, but Ska is not about nostalgia. It wasn't even when we were doing it. You could, you know, going back to this sort of concept or maybe fallacy of purity, you know, purist bands and labels and stuff like that. But Ska is weird. It it tends to sound very little like it's origins um, i would say kind of... i think nostalgia was the bad that was more for 80s but you're right now nostalgia isn't connected with this because you can do a newer advancement on the sound and it's i just don't think that it, it, just kind of your point of it having this new resurgence and not having new waves and stuff i think it kind of just earned its place and then the, like you know going back to the purest thing like they're the ones showing up for it and they're not and it's like it's mm-hmm. like hey we're gonna go do our thing over here and then it's like the people who love it, they're like, oh, fuck, I'm going there. And the people who don't, they're just like either not paying attention and they're like, yeah, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go there and be an asshole and just be like, this sucks. Yeah. 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 Which was an actual thing. That was something you might choose to do in the 90s. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go to this show just to let everyone know how much I hate them. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. That sounds like a good use of my Saturday. <laughs> Check this out. I'm going to tell them they suck when they start playing. You're like, okay. Yeah, thanks. it's going to be awesome. <laughs> and we're going to go home and cry. Listen to emo bands or something like that. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, cool, man. Um, I don't know. I've kind of... Actually, and real quick, when you guys did break up, like, what was Mike's reaction from Asian Man? Oh. <sighs> You know, I think Mike had been frustrated with us for a long time, and he was not pleased about Run Screaming. I think he would be the first to admit that. So it was, um, he certainly wasn't begging us to keep going. But, you know, if I had known 18 years later that, that we would be having this conversation and that we just played, I guess, last year a show with the Bruce Lee Band and Mike turned 50, I would say, it's all good. That worked out yeah. probably way better than it could have in more if we had gone down more predictable paths. So I have no complaints. I'm sure Mike has many complaints, but we still but the love is still there and we still talk and play together and that's the most important thing. Yeah. I mean, is that, is that the show? There's two, well, there's two videos I saw on it in YouTube and I want to kind of just touch on these for a second. There's a one of you guys playing live, and it looks kind of recently. Was that from that show you're talking about? It's hard. Like we've done, we've reunited every one or two years, and it's often at bottom of the hill. I get confused as to which years these shows are. Um, so I guess if I'm wearing a green T-shirt, that would be last year. Yes. If I'm wearing a more dumpy black button-up and have uh, some extremely 90s bangs that's 2018 with the siren six okay yeah there's a there's one with yeah you see you with a green shirt on yeah that was last year okay that looks like a very small stage how big was that club yeah Uh, bottom of the hill what is that like 300 maybe okay it's kind of perfect yes it is a small stage but um dear god on tour you know Sometimes you roll up to basically a coffee house with a stage big enough for a single singer songwriter. You make it work. So a stage like that, I think we're still like sweet. Okay, really. Yeah. That's the the risk of chipping someone's teeth is uh is slightly lower. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, especially when you got nine fucking guys. Nine fucking guys skanking their forty year old brains out. <laughs> <laughs> well what this other video that's on trapped like rats in myers flat this it's like a soccer video with girls is this you guys or does someone put this video together themselves 
Good lord. I have, have you seen no this? idea what that is. It no. is it's Slow Gherkin, Trapped Like Rats, and Myers Flat. Album, Shed Some Skin, Video Clips, Breakfast Club, Police Academy, Ghoulies, Sesame Street, Bikini Soccer. That was it. Someone, no way. Yeah, it's a video. Someone uploaded it June 3rd, 2008. Because so, I, I found this, and I'm, I'm like watching it, and it just starts with these girls who are like taking their pants off, but they're wearing oh. bikinis, um, and they're kicking soccer balls at the goal. And I'm looking at this video going, I, you know, I don't think this really matches the tone of this band so much. And I'm really oh, confused about this. Yeah, I'll do. Here, I'll send you the link through Skype. Send me the link. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, that it sounds maybe we don't want that out there. Yeah, and that's um, why I was confused. I was like, man, I'm like, that, that's a ballsy decision that you guys put this together. And then as I'm scrolling through it, it's got Breakfast Club. And then I'm like reading through it. And this, this guy, it's like, oh, someone did this on their own. Yeah, but okay. that, that, that's definitely out there. Well, we, no, we only made one music video for a song off Shed Some Skin called How Now Lowbrow, which actually, you know, like everything we did at that time, is a giant clusterfuck. There's like so many ideas in it. And um, we worked with a film student. It's karaoke themed. I'm in drag twice um, <laughs> because we were making fake karaoke videos. There was there, you'll find one where I'm in a flowing Renaissance gown and AJ's playing a lute and uh, and he just uh, kissed me. But like there was one take where it was like, come on, guys, you got to kick this up a notch. And AJ just threw the lute and gave me this big, passionate smooch that made the cut. <laughs> um, so it's a fun video um, if you do links or anything in the. Yeah. On your site. Yeah, I'll put this on that. the webpage. Every t- yeah, everyone gets their own landing page. So I usually find oh, nice. either images or um, like uh, I just had Pogo on and uh, Keith sent me a bunch of pictures. So I made like a slideshow on their page. But yeah, I'll definitely th- I'm, I'm watching this video now. Just just like scan it through and I'm mute. This is, looks pretty good. There's acting involved. It's a whole thing. It's, uh, There's black and white footage of yeah something. It's like woman, this old woman. Yeah. Is that footage or is that very like... influenced by David Lynch? Oh, okay. No, not really. Oh. Okay. Um. <laughs> yeah, get into it. Cool, man. Like she's clapping at the end. Nice. Yeah. Um. Cool, man. Well, uh, I usually wrap this up with two questions. Okay. And number one, what would you like to plug? And it could either be for you. Uh, or it could be someone that you want to give uh, a spotlight to. Oh, shit. Very good question. I think I'll have to go with friends. You know, I, my one of my greatest joys in life is is checking out my friends' music. And um, there's still so many great bands in Santa Cruz. So I will recommend, and I'm going to type this out for you, a yep. band called Hod. And the helpers, they are are led by a guy named Hod, who's one of the great Santa Cruz weirdos. Um, Santa Cruz is well known for weirdos and vampires, and and Hod might be both. And he was a band guy back when when we were going, and he's an incredible songwriter. Um, it's kind of impossible to describe because it's both really funny and weird, and also very soulful. And the helpers. AJ plays keyboard in it. Dan Podhast plays um, pedal steel, not pedal steel, lap steel, and a uh, bunch of other great Santa Cruz players are in it. Matt from Slow Gurkin plays sometimes. So it's this weird like Santa Cruz super group. I just want everyone to know about it because it's hard to like, it's, it's kind of a hard sell because it's, as you can hear, it's really hard to describe. But once you get into it and after this sort of like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> you'll fall in love with it okay the new album is called the optimist optimist jesus optimist both of those look wrong <laughs> yeah this is on this is on spotify hot and the helpers optimist and Ten, okay good yeah optimist is it and then all right yeah i'll link to that on the on the Great. page too sweet man um all right so final question hit me 
what scene ethics do you hold on to to this day? Scene ethics. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> An openness to people, to everyone, everyone at that show, other bands, crew, anyone who shows up. A willingness to connect with people, no matter what, get their story, um, maybe make friends, maybe make a, a connection, maybe make pen pals, whatever. Um, but I do think that ska gives you a sort of a foundation of of sort of understanding and respect in most cases, because you're in such a joyous context that you can connect with anyone if you if you go out there and and sort of open yourself to that possibility 